for another episode of Jim Up the Garden. Okay, so I haven't done a comment section for over a month now, and I do apologise. Normally what I do is any comments that come through um, on the channel, I don't always get a chance to, um, to look at them on a sort of reasonably regular basis. I do try, but with one thing and another, I've, been, I've just been far too busy with um, work and stuff like that, and I do apologise. But what I've done is I've gone back over the comments, and I just want to go through some of those with you now. So the first one comes from um, Crazy uh, Craig Z89. Uh, and he was talking about uh, the cucumbers um, and he was saying do you always keep the cucumbers in the tray uh, yes what you do is basically fill the fill the pot you know you need a reasonable size pot something like a 12 inch pot um, sit that in the tray and then basically all you need to do then is water, put the cucumber plant in obviously um, water the pot initially so that the the compost in the pot is wet um, and then all you need to do is just keep the, the tray at the bottom full of water and what you'll find is that the roots will come out of the pot and into the water and those are the, those are the, the roots from the cucumber plant which are after the, 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 basically the water. So all you need to do then is just keep the, the tray topped up with water um, and, the, and the cucumber will have more than enough um, you know, nutrient and water from that. Uh, the water will, go, will keep the compost moist um, through capillary action basically. It's like when you're walking on a beach um, the sand can look dry and when you stand on the um, the sand the sand becomes wet and you can see your footprints that's basically the same thing. Um, so basically what happens is the um, the water will, will sort of draw itself up inside the compost and then it'll keep your um, cucumbers watered. There's two real benefits from this. One, cucumbers, well any gourd really they're terrible for rotting off at the at the base of the uh, the plant. So basically, what you get is if if it's wet at the bottom of the stalk, what will happen is the uh, the plant basically rots off, and then the plant obviously dies. Um, so it, it prevents that because it stops the compost being too wet at the top. Secondly, uh, the benefit that it gives you is you only need to water your cucumbers a couple of times a week, if if not once a week, because all you need to do is keep that tray um, at least with sort of half an inch or so of water in there and um, just keep topping that up every week or so and um, that will be more than enough. Obviously you can still water from the top so if you are going to give your cucumbers feed or um, if you've got any problems like the leaves are going yellow and you want to give them some um, um, y you know, potassium or something like that um, through putting Epsom salts into the water water that onto the top because then that will go into the compost and then you know, it'll get the nutrients that way. What you don't want to do is put any nutrients in the water tray itself. Reason being is you'll get algae and stuff like that growing, and I've got a little bit of algae growing in mine, which is which is where the the goodness has kind of leached out of the soil and gone into the water as well. So um, I've got a little bit of algae. But you know, there's nothing to worry about. But uh, you know, it's better that you don't have algae in the uh, the water if you can help it. But um, if you do get algae, what you can do obviously is empty the tray out altogether, give it a clean, and then start again. But uh, I mean, I've, I've got a bit of algae in mine. I'm not too worried. But uh, anyway, but yeah, all you need to do is keep the tray, you know, with water in. If it does dry out altogether, um, you know, don't worry. Just put some more water back in it. But if it does dry out altogether, just give your uh, cucumber plants a few, um, um, you know, some water as well. Because um, what you need is you need the compost to be wet for it to draw the uh, the water from the bottom. So uh, just you know, just if it does dry out altogether, just make sure you give the give them some water on the top as well. You can grow lots of different plants like this. As you've seen I've got all my chilies and my peppers growing exactly the same way. And there's no reason why you couldn't grow tomatoes this way as well. You could put your tomatoes in, in pots and then sit them in the trays and then just water the tray. Okay, um 
The next comment comes from um, Billy the Loam Gardener, and it's all about hard, so um, hard soil basically. Now Linda Penny put a message on um, saying that she'd got a, a patch of ground and the ground is really hard. And uh, um, Billy's come up with a really good um, comment, and he is right. Um, if you if you've got a piece of ground that you're planning to dig over next year, or you know in you know in a few years' time. If you've got a piece of ground that you know you're not using or anything like that, this is a really good thing to do. Cover the ground with cardboard and uh, a manure. So put put any old cardboard will do over the over the top um, of the ground. This will do this will do two or three things. One, it'll hold the moisture in the ground. Secondly, it'll stop any weeds growing. So it's like a weed membrane, if you like. Um, and what this will do is it'll encourage worms into the ground, um, and then the worms will go through the ground and basically they'll, they'll loosen the ground up for you make it a lot easier. So by doing this um, what you do is you stop um, any weeds growing, any seeds or anything like that. Also what you'll do is you'll is you'll keep the moisture in there which will encourage the, the worms to go in there and sort of break it all up for you. Um, what you can also do is on top of the cardboard, so put a layer of cardboard down onto the piece of ground that you're, that, that you're planning to use and then put uh, manure on top of that uh, the, uh, the, mature, uh, the, the manure doesn't have to be well rotted down, it can be fresh manure because obviously you're going to leave it there for a year or so to, you know, it'll rot down anyway. But the, the manure will do two things, obviously it'll put more nutrients into the ground. It'll also weight the, uh, the cardboard down so the cardboard won't move, but it'll also hold the moisture in as well and obviously it'll fertilise the ground. So if you've got a piece of ground that, uh, that, that, you know, that you want to sort out, cover it with cardboard, obviously cut the weeds down as best you can. Cover the cover the whole piece of ground with cardboard, and then pile manure on top of that, and then just leave it for six, nine months, um, even twelve months. And what that'll do is it'll it'll get the ground into a condition where it's nice and moist. The worms have gone in there and broken it all up. So when you go to dig it, the cardboard will will break down, and you know the worms will kind of eat that and take that into the um, the, uh, the soil as well. But all you need to do then is basically fork the ground over. Um, you, you know, sort of rotivate it over, and then it'll be, you know, you know, good to grow. It'll make it a lot easier for you to to dig. It'll fertilise the ground, and also what it'll do is it'll keep the weeds, you know, sort of suppressed on that piece of ground whilst you're not using it. So uh, if you're, you know, planning to use a bit of ground, so that was a really good tip, Billy. Um, next one comes from um, Jason Smith, and he was talking about. Uh, I'd made a few comments back in June about how many seeds I've had not germinating or different crops bolting and stuff like that and I think the problem that we've had is this year we've had an unusual year um, not that any year is particularly um, usual if you like but uh, we, we always tend to have different sort of weather um, you know year on year but that's what makes gardening interesting really because that's what creates the challenges you know to get over but this year we've had um, we had quite a wet start at least where I live uh, we had quite a wet start we had quite a few sort of um, rainstorms that were that were quite heavy then we had a, a three month period pretty much where we had almost no rain and the weather was really hot which was unusual for the UK and now we've got into um, sort of the back end of July uh, beginning of August we've had nothing but rain so um, you know a lot of the crops that have been bolting things like um, onions and, and um, perpetual spinach the chards um, and normal spinach and stuff like that this is this has been down to heat more than anything. Uh, these plants don't particularly like the weather to be too hot. So uh, my spinach uh, beet I've watered quite regularly, and the uh, the onions I've watered regularly. However, I've had a reasonable amount of onions that have bolted. I've had out of 500 onions, I've had about um, probably about two dozen or so that have actually bolted. You know, formed seeds at the top. I've also had quite a few onions that haven't really grown properly at all. They've 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 not really grown, you know, you know, they've just got they haven't got much bigger than they were when I put them in. Um, so, you know, I mean, when you're planting sets, onion sets, you can expect a certain number of them to 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 bolt anyway. But this year we've had a reasonable number that you, you, you know more than usual. Um, and I don't think it's down to the water. I think it's just down to the you know the hot weather that we've been having which has caused them to um, sort of panic I mean the, the the whole purpose for any plant the thing you need to remember is is um, the whole purpose for any plant particularly an annual or a biannual is to is to is to grow and create seed and uh, and to set its seed for the you know for the following season 
um, and any plant, if it, if it gets stressed or um, sort of panicked, if you like, what it'll do, it'll just run to seed straight away. So that's why we've had um, certain things that have germinated. You know, I mean, I've had um, some some plants that I haven't shown on videos, but I've had um, um, calendula flowers that have been that high with flowers on them. I mean, they've literally been, you know, sort of a month or so old. They've only grown to that high. And they've got a little flower on the top of them because the plant has, has, has been that warm um, that it's panicked and created a flower bud and you know and actually bloomed. Where you know obviously calendula should get to sort of you know 18 inches high or something like that before they even start to think about generating flowers. Um, with the the spinach beet, exactly the same thing. Um, I've had three different three different lots of spinach go in. Um, I've grown three different lots for a successional um, crop. Um, and spinach beet should be in the ground for around 12 months so you put it in it grows you keep harvesting it you keep pulling at it and it just keeps creating more and more and more leaves and then the following um, the following spring sort of May time it should then throw up its um, flower stalk and then run to seed where this year pretty much everyone I've put in has run to seed straight away and that's not been through watering because they have been watered it's just the heat um, and the uh, you know the weather conditions have, have caused it to panic and, and sort of um, run to seed. So that's why we've had kind of poor um, poor germination uh, because of temperature. Uh, you know the temperature's been up and down. It's been really hot in the day, reasonably cool at night. So this kind of sweeping in um, temperature doesn't doesn't help. And also uh, the really hot days um, has caused um, germination to be reasonably poor, and also things bolted. So. But, but you know you can you can only do you know what the weather allows you to do, um, and some years the weather's like this, and you, you, you know that's that's just that's just the way it is. Um, Fifty Shades of Green put a um, a comment down about um, comfrey tea. Um, obviously, I've been doing the comfrey tea over there. Normally, I do it in a bin, to be honest with you. But this year, I put it in the uh, the wormery, or, or what was the wormery. Um, so I could show you in a bit more detail of how to do it, and it makes it easier in there as well. But the um, um, Fifty Shades of Green and also um, Kimmy's Kitchen uh, also put a comment down about um, borage and nettle. Borage and nettle tea are all very good as well. The things with borage is really good um, for a number of um, um, things. It, it tends to grow as weeds in my allotment. To be honest with you. I don't purposely grow it. But uh, I'll come on to that a little um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few moments. What you need to remember is there are three main um, nutrients that you need for plants. You've got nitrogen. Now nitrogen's really good for sort of leaf growth and uh, you know forming the leaves and the, st and, the, and the stems and stuff like that. So if your plants are struggling with um, the stems or the leaves, that's typically what's, what, you, um, what you're short of. Nitrogen's rich in a number of things. Um, um, things like uh, used coffee grounds, which is what, what I use, um, is very rich in nitrogen. So that's why when you're when you want anything to rot down quickly, or if you're growing things like beans are quite um, like a lot of nitrogen in the ground, or any leafy um, crops, things like brassicas, um, th th that you're going to eat the leaves. Obviously, things like kale, um, spinach. Um, Obviously, spinach is not a brassica, but you know what I mean. You know anything that you eat in the leaves of lettuce, um, um, kales, and things like that, um, or flower sprouts, because they're really the leaves. Um, anything, any crop like that, what you want to do is make the ground nitrogen rich, and that'll give the plant all the nitrogen it needs to, um, to you know, to grow the leaves. When you're trying to rot things down, uh, the bacteria which which um, causes um, vegetable matter to rot down also needs nitrogen as a, as a food to um, to break things down so that's why it's good to put um, coffee grounds and things like that into your um, compost another way of doing this is um, you know people always say that um, you know if you're if you want to have a really healthy compost to you know to rot things down always mix brown and green matter together browns obviously rich in carbon anything that's green um, is 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 rich in nitrogen. So anything that's like grass cuttings, things like that, that's um, that's rich in nitrogen. So if you put um, in in your compost, what you should do is put in any brown matter, so that you know twigs and you know chippings and things like that. But also dig into that 
grass cuttings and, and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, green stuff. And what that'll do is the green stuff is high in nitrogen, which will allow the bacteria to thrive and then break up all the brown brown matter and stuff like that. But coming back to comfrey tea uh, and nettle tea and uh, borage and things like that, um, comfrey is very high in um, potassium. Um, it, it, it's, it's got the three things, okay, let's go back. The three things are nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, potassium, or NPK, which is what they're uh, normally referred to. And you do need all three of them for any plant to survive. However, different plants obviously need different sort of ratios of those to thrive properly. Anything that's growing fruit like tomatoes, um, you know, to grow the tomatoes and the, uh, and, and, and the flowers correctly, you need potassium. Anything which is a root vegetable, things like, I don't know, carrots or swedes or um, parsnips or anything like that, you need high phosphorus, uh, which is the P. Um, and then anything that's growing leaves, you want the leaves to grow, um, you need nitrogen. So, comfrey is very high in um, potassium, so that's why I always use um, comfrey tea in the greenhouse because I want the, the ground in the greenhouse to be very high in potassium so I get lots of big tomatoes. Obviously what I also need in here is nitrogen so that the, the leaves will grow correctly and also phosphorus so that the roots and the, uh, the buds will form properly as well. But comfrey has all of those things but it's, it's, it's richer in the uh, potassium which is what I need for the fruit. Borage and um, nettle tea is also very good but Borage and nettle are high in nitrogen, not so high in phosphorus and potassium. So um, nettle tea are good for um, good for plants that need um, nitrogen rich soil. Things like beans or um, brassicas, anything that you eat the leaves on, uh, you know they, you know that's where you want the uh, the nitrogen. If you if you fed tomato plants with a very high nitrogen um, content fertilizer. Um, what you will get is lots of leaves, um, but not many tomatoes. And obviously, what you want are the tomatoes. If you know, if you understand what I mean. But putting nettle tea on tomatoes, there's nothing wrong with that at all because you still have got potassium and, and um, um, phosphorus in there. But um, you're much better off putting comfrey tea on tomatoes because because it's very high in the um, in the potassium, which is what you need for the fruit. So uh, I hope I've made myself clear there. I know it's a bit, but you need to think of the three. Um, depending on what, what, what you're cropping off a given plant. Um, all plants need all three, but you need to give more of one of them depending on what type of plant it is. Um, the next um, comment comes from David Williams. And back in June, I was talking about the, um, the Swedes that I'd grown in, in, in modules and put in the ground uh, because of a beetle that goes through. The beetle I was talking about was the flea beetle. Um, and there's two main sorts. There's the... Um, uh, there's the crucifer flea beetle and also the striped flea beetle. Apart from the patterns on the back, they're pretty much the same thing. They're just two varieties of the same, um, or, or two species of the same um, kind of beetle, really. But they go along eating little holes in the leaves. Um, and the, it, it can get to the point where if there's enough of it, they'll, they'll basically stunt the growth, if not kill the plant altogether. If you grow swedes in um, modules, let them grow in there till the... Um, I don't know, four or five inches high. Um, the leaves get a bit harder, uh, a bit tougher then, and the beetles are much less likely to uh, uh, to attack and you know sort of eat the way through the leaves. They typically attack young leaves or young seedlings. Um, so if you can get them to sort of four inches high, the leaves tend to harden off a little bit, and it's harder for the beetles to kind of get the teeth into them. Good one. Um, the next comment comes from um, John Russell. And he was saying that I've used the wormery this year for um, the um, the comfrey tea. What's happened to the worms? Have you still got a wormery? I have kind of still got a wormery. I've got two big, well I've actually got four, but I'm using two at the moment. Two big black um, bins, you know, the open bottom bins um, that I put all the weeds and stuff like that in. Now, these had already got worms in anyway because they've, they've been in the same position now for three or four years. So there's plenty of worms in there. So every time I lift the lid, there's loads of worms crawling about. And I've got to be honest with you, the worms had been in that container for over 12 months and I thought it was only fair that I released them and let them return to the wild as it were. So there were loads of worms in the wormery. So what I did is I got all the worms out 
um, I let the I let the water level rise in the in the wormery so that all the worms came to the top. I, I got them all off the top and put that into the compost to set them free, if you like. And then I used the the um, the the worm drills. You know, all, you know what was left in the wormery actually in the greenhouse. So I spread it um, in the borders here. Um, so there are a few worms in the greenhouse as well. Um, so if you water, sometimes you see them coming to the surface. But um, I, I set all the worms free because I felt sorry for them. I thought they'd been in the container for long enough now, so I'll, I'll I'll set them free into the compost. So they're all now in the compost, living living very happy lives. And I've used the container again to do the comforting. Uh, next comment comes from Allotment Life. Um, oh, and this was when the um, I was saying I'd I'd gone down the allotment and there was um, a few of the uh, the potato plants had been knocked over and you could see that the ground had been scratched at. And um, Allotment Live put a comment on it's more likely not to be cats, and I think you're probably right. I've got a couple of cats and they come up here. Uh, there are other cats up here, so I think you're probably right. I think a cat's probably been scratching the ground and used it as a toilet, probably. But um, anyway, uh, next one comes from Ophelia's Allotment, um, and she was saying about she's also had her run of beans unraveling themselves and falling on the ground and stuff, and she's had to tie them up like I, like I have this year. Now, I, I don't normally need to tie them up, I normally set them off, you know, when they get to sort of two foot high. I just make sure they're going up the right pole, because sometimes they can go to the pole next door, or work their way across the ground or something. But as soon as you start them off, they typically just go straight up the pole. This year we've had quite a bit of wind, um, quite a few sort of windy evenings, particularly at the beginning of the spring. And they were all blowing them off, and um, there's been a few people put comments down, so we've had um, a Phillies allotment, we've also had... Um, Pongo Pom um, saying that his beans have been unraveling as well. We've also had uh, Grow and Tell um, comments as well. So I think it's been quite common. And other people have said that they've had beans in, I can't remember who made the comment now, but somebody said they had, um, oh, I think it was um, Philly's allotment actually. She said she's got beans in her allotment and also she's got some more at home in a sheltered garden. The ones in the sheltered garden have just gone straight up, no problem at all, because there's no wind. Upper allotment, she said they've, they've been coming off and she's had to tie them up, so I think it's the wind that's caused it to go with it. Uh, next one comes from Grow and Tell, and this was that moth that I found on the, uh, the tomato down there. I must admit, I've not seen any other caterpillar moths, uh, uh, moth caterpillars in here, but I have found a couple of tomatoes that have had sort of holes nibbled into the side of them, which I've kind of thrown away. Um, but um, apparently, they are, um, they've, they've been identified as, um, it's called the, the, the moth caterpillar uh, or the tomato horn worm um, and it's also called the tobacco horn moth um, which came from Gord 747. Um, Barry, Ash, Barry Ashcroft also put some comments in, there's been a few people comments about this. Uh, and apparently it's the larvae stage of the, the hummingbird hawk moth and apparently they're quite pretty now um, I think it was I think it was bear worm or possibly um, Gort 742 who said that the, uh, they've actually seen one of these moths and it's kind of a sort of pinky browny quite, quite a large moth um, now these were first sighted uh, uh, Maggie H has put a comment in to say that they were sighted in Cornwall a couple of years ago, um, and this is this is this is another thing about sort of um, gardening. It's it's constantly changing. Um, obviously, as you know, the planet goes through this kind of cycle where the weather gets warmer and then cooler. We're actually in, in, in you know sort of one of the warmer periods, which is why we don't really have particularly bad winters at the moment. Um, I mean, I don't remember. I think two thousand and two was the, the the last bad winter that we had, and it wasn't that bad. Um, but um, you know, I mean, I can remember when I was you know, a kid that, you know, we used to have five foot of snow and, you know, it was always really cold. Uh, and if you go back even further, it was worse than that. But because the weather's sort of gradually warming up, and this is not this is not global warming, this is um, the, the, the earth goes through this cycle of getting hotter, then colder, hotter, then colder. And it's kind of every 200 years or so. Uh, we're in a hot period at the moment. But this means that we get... Um, different weather obviously but we also get different insects as well so insects that would normally be um, associated with like the equator or the um, you know that, that, that you know that sort of part of the planet 
um, start to migrate north and south. So you get you know a much wider band. Um, or in fact, the equator might be that hot now that they've actually separated and they're in the um, you know the sort of more north or more south regions more than where they would be normally. Um, so it makes it interesting because you get you know different different um, insects and pests and stuff. Um, you know, in uh, I mean things like the allium um, um, leaf miner and that 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 wasn't um, anywhere near as bad as it is now. Um, as it was kind of ten years ago, that's you know the the um, the amount of them that are about now are considerably higher because of the weather conditions are allowing it. Um, so you know gardening's always you know it's an organic thing if you can excuse the pun. It's constantly changing, so uh, which, which I guess makes it more interesting. But um, Mags also put a um, another comment down about these alicante tomatoes I've got on the on the right or your left. Um, you know, these are the uh, the money maker tomatoes here, and they've grown really well this year. You know, as, as good as they do normally. Even though I've only got sort of mainly three fruit trusses on each plant, these these alicantes are they're spindly, weak little things, and they're nowhere near as good as they normally are. Um, and Mag said, what it could possibly be is the ground, because she's saying that she's um, um, you, you know con contamination in the compost. Um, has been um, seen, um, and this can weaken tomato plants, particularly uh, in, in uh, tomato plants. And she's saying that some green waste, uh, you know, like the council do, um, where that's put, made back into compost for people and stuff. Now, I haven't used that type of compost, but, um, or, or at least not this year anyway, um, but there could be some contaminants in the ground. But it's it's funny where uh, the, the, the compost in these two... Um, borders both sides should be pretty much the same because they come from the same place um, and it's it's funny how um, this side's grown well and I've got you know plenty of you know nice healthy growth and lots of tomatoes and this side seems to be quite weak so uh, it would have been interesting actually to have put a, a money maker um, tomato on this side and to, you know to see how that would have grown on this side maybe it is the alicante or it could be um, the, the, the ground itself I'm not quite sure but um, but yeah, I just wanted to mention that. So thanks. That came from Mag H. So thanks for that comment. Um, the next one comes from um, Grow Roots for Life, um, talking about um, the uh, the tomatoes again, and uh, they said to give it a good feed of comfrey tea. Now I do feed these um, three times a week with comfrey comfrey tea. So I don't think it's the nutrients in the ground. Um, I've, I've got my suspicions that the ground on this side of the greenhouse um, is um, damper than this side, so the ground could be too damp. The other thing that I've thought of is the fact that I've grown the beans there this year has meant that this side of the greenhouse is a little bit more shaded, so this side of the greenhouse gets the, the morning sun and then the sun goes round behind me and then this side of the greenhouse gets the afternoon sun. Uh, and I'm thinking that because of the trees and the, the beans and that this side, uh, that these tomatoes haven't got quite as much light. And also, that's probably why the ground is a little bit damper than, than on this side. So I'm thinking that the problem that I've had with some of the tomato plants on here also is the fact that the bottoms of um, on two or three of the plants on this side have actually rotted. Um, I've had this slight fungus at the bottom of the plant. Uh, where the bottom of the plant's rotted off, which is a sign that the ground is too wet, they're sitting in water. So um, I'm thinking that's possibly something to do with it, but um, who knows, I can only I can only kind of guess what's going wrong. But um, definitely this side hasn't grown well at all this year. Um, um, Christine um, Y. Taker, I think you uh, pronounce it, uh, is asked, what cucumber varieties have I grown? I always grow female F1. Uh, those are the darker ones, um, and I've also grown a different variety this year. I'll just get the label. Uh, now these came from um, oh, my job. Do do? these came from um, the garden centre, and they're a grafted. It said uh, grafted vegetable plant cucumber F1 um, Dally Star. Uh, that's the that's the label. Uh, what it is, it's basically a rootstock that's got the, the top part of the plant grafted onto it, so it's a very strong root. And I must admit, the 
the roots have come out into the tray at the bottom and there's loads of roots from that one so it's got a really strong rootstock where the top of the plant is obviously grafted from a different variety which is the which is the um, Dally Star, F1 Dally Star um, which, is, which is only female so I'd imagine that the, the actual rootstock is a standard um, you know strong rootstock of a cucumber um, which is probably male and female, which would have had male and female flowers on it and the what's been grafted on the top of it is purely fit, so you know so I only get female flowers on there but uh, they they have grown really well I must admit the cucumbers haven't done as well as they normally do I normally get about 10 cucumbers per plant and I've got six plants in uh, one plant got snapped off to be fair which is my fault um, and uh, the others don't seem to have done quite as well I think so far this year I think I've had 16 cucumbers so far and normally by now I've had uh, I'm probably into the 30s by now normally so I've had about half the cucumbers as I normally do and I think that's primarily down to the fact of the weather again I think it's been too hot for them and uh, it's been quite bright as well and cucumbers don't particularly like too much light uh, they like a kind of dappled shade type condition um, but uh, they are growing well and I also admit they went in a little bit later but um, I've had a lot of cucumbers that have formed but they've kind of the fruits have rotted off uh, you know they've not on, um, they've not germinated anyway uh, sorry no, they haven't pollinated anyway also because they're a single sexed um, what's name but they kind of the fruits have grown and they've been about an inch or two longer then they just rotted off uh, you know and they haven't formed properly so I've had quite a bit of that this year um, and I think that's down to weather, to be honest with you. But uh, anyway, that's the cucumbers. Uh, next comment comes from um, Allotment Life and Deborah Shannon. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, and they were also talking about the, um, the yellowing of the leaves. Now, uh, to my knowledge, there's three reasons why cucumbers' leaves, or, or any gourd leaves, will go yellow. Uh, one is potassium deficiency, um, and you get around that by watering Epsom salts onto it, so just make up a weak solution on watery time. Um, in Epsom salts you've got potassium in there, so that'll add potassium back into the uh, the soil. There's, even if you've got a healthy plant, there's no reason why you can't do that. Just put some Epsom salts into some water every so often and water them, um, and that will make sure that they've got enough nutrient. Um, the second thing you can do is overwater them that can also cause the leaves to go yellow or underwater them uh, where they've dried out and they've, um, um, they've gone a little bit yellow or the third reason is too much light as I've explained cucumbers and courgettes, pumpkins, squashes and all that kind of stuff don't like particularly to have direct sunlight they like to be in a, in a, in a more shaded um, sort of um, condition if you like and you can tell this by the by the sheer size of the leaves plants that have large leaves have evolved to be in a not so bright place um, leaves um, plants that have got smaller leaves have evolved to be in a, a, a in a brighter condition if you like so things like gourds and um, hollyhocks and rhubarb and stuff have got massive leaves so you'd expect them to be in a in a more shaded or less light type um, environment um, uh, uh, that's a that's that's a rule of thumb, to, obviously. Um, so um, uh, the the yellowing of the leaves that I've had on there um, started at the bottom, and I water the plants with Epsom salt, and the new leaves that have grown at the top are actually now green. So I think mine was probably potassium deficiency, but you can also cause the leaves to go yellow through um, either too much watering, too little watering, or um, too much light. So I just thought I'd mention that. Okay, last couple of comments. The one, uh, the first one comes from a Phillies allotment again, uh, and she was saying, "How many runner bean seeds did you grow? Um, how many runner bean plants did you grow?" Um, the answer to that is too many. <laughs> I grew, um, I actually grew about 180 plants, of which um, 60 were to go um, uh, to my father. Um, I actually put in this year somewhere in the region of 140. I think. Uh, if memory serves me well, there's 144 plants that went in. I've grown far too many to be honest with you because I've, I ended up putting um, two plants per cane because I've got that many plants. Um, I didn't. I wasn't quite sure because things weren't germinating particularly well. I put in another 33 more than I would normally. Um, so I, I normally aim for kind of 100 plants or so. 
um, and then I did this extra th tray of uh, 33 um, and every single one came um, so I, I just put them all in the ground but they are I, I've got beans coming out my ears to honest here. and that's one of the reasons why I've not been doing so many videos recently because I've spent the last three weeks picking beans and chopping them and freezing them so uh, I've got kilo after kilo in fact my freezer's about half full now of beans um, and that's both the climbing beans and also the runner beans down at the bottom um, so what I have actually done actually this year, I've done a bit of an experiment uh, I've looked in um, various books and there's, there's, there's numerous ways that you can store um, runner beans obviously you know there's the, there's the freezing side which is what I do um, and you can either blanch them for two minutes first, so chop them all up uh, put them in a saucepan um, and then pour boiling water on, bring them up to the boil let them, let them simmer for about two minutes then put them into cold water let them cool down quickly because you don't want to cook them, you just want to blanch them. Um, and then bag them up and then into bags, you know, however many you want. And then put them in the freezer. That's what I normally do. Um, but that's reasonably labour intensive because I've had so many. Uh, what I've also been doing this year is I've done some like that. I've done about 20 or so kilos, no more than that, about 30 kilos like that. Um, but what the last, um, the last 10 kilos that I've picked, all I've done is chopped them up and then put them straight into the freezer, I haven't blanched them at all. All I've done is um, taken the two ends off and then chopped them into kind of one inch sections uh, and then bagged them up into one kilo bags is the way I do it and then put them straight into the freezer like that. And I'll let you know how we get on. Now I've, I've, I've read numerous cookery books and um, preserve books that I've got and uh, in all of them they say that you know you can just put them straight into the freezer. So um, I've given that a go yet. So I'm not quite sure how they'll turn out. If they're better blanched and then frozen, or just frozen, or, or what I don't know. Um, but um, I'll, uh, I think the rest of the beans that I pick, I'll just chop them and put them straight into the freezer rather than blanching them. And then I'll um, see how we get on. I'll let you know. And the last comment comes from um, Grow and Tell, and uh, they were saying about the the, the the holes in the rhubarb. Now, I've I've never known rhubarb leaves be eaten before. Um, rhubarb um, contains, the leaves of rhubarb um, contain um, diacobolic acid which is poisonous. Uh, there's a famous Conan Doyle book, uh, um, Sherlock Holmes, where somebody actually uses the leaves of rhubarb um, and boils them up and gets the juice off to actually kill somebody with the, the juice that you get off rhubarb leaves. And you can also, um, there's an old Victorian pesticide trick that you can do where you, you cut all the leaves off rhubarb, you know, get a, a, a few um, leaves off, you know, 20, 30 leaves off uh, your rhubarb. And you chop it up and you boil the leaves, or simmer the leaves. Um, and then you take off the, the juice off the leaves as a, as a liquor. And then you, you water that down and spray that onto aphids, and that's supposed to kill um, aphids off, because um, it's, it's poisonous, because it's got this diacobolic acid in it. Um, that's not something I'd recommend because the, the procedure of, um, if, you, if you simmer the leaves, if, if, if my memory is correct, if you simmer the leaves at about sort of 80 degrees or so, um, the, the poison, the diacobolic acid, stays in the liquor. Whereas if you, if you literally boil it, so you bring it up to 100 degrees or something, it actually comes off as a vapour and if you breathe it in, obviously you're breathing in the poison. So, um, if you are to do it, I strongly recommend you do it outside, but in all honesty, I'd just go down the, if you are going to put a pesticide on, I'd go down the garden centre and buy some, because uh, I think the procedure of actually making it is a little bit dangerous. So, um, but anyway, um, the holes on the uh, the rhubarb, I mean, I've grown rhubarb in this allotment now for sort of 13 years, I've never known any of the leaves to have any holes in. Um, I've also grown rhubarb in the garden and that before, and I've never known that to have leaves, uh, holes in the leaves either. But um, Grow and Teller put a comment on saying that um, that uh, they actually found holes in their uh, rhubarb last year, and they also found these little brown hairy caterpillars uh, that are vet. And obviously, um, you know, these caterpillars may well be immune to the uh, to the poison that's in the uh, the rhubarb leaves, but uh, seemingly they must be because they they, they they keep eating at them. Um, but not that it's a real problem because I'm not going to eat the rhubarb leaves anyway. But uh, but yeah, so they they put a comment and say that there is a caterpillar, whether it be a moth or a or a butterfly, I'm not quite sure, 
um, that uh, that they've seen eating holes in their rhubarb as well. So uh, anyway, those are the comments. I do apologise for not doing a comment section before now, and uh, I also do apologise that some of these comments have been on the channel um, page for uh, a month or so, and I'm not responding. I can only apologise for that. But um, I hope the answers that I've given are informative and interesting. And um, thanks for all of your comments. I really appreciate that. So I hope this episode was of some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments you've got below, and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Long Garden.